question about it. The 1990s have really been the Apple decade. 1997. Apple turns 20 this year, and everybody's celebrating from Cooper Petey to Cupertino. Just look anywhere in the media between 1987 and 1997. Apple is in everything from news to stand-up comedy. Been They're everywhere. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a computer. They're everywhere. They rest a precarious living from the desert here in Ulan Bator, relying upon only instinct and several Apple computers. <laughs> they're everywhere and they're all communicating. Shuttle flight 472 is now boarding. The white zone is for loading and unloading. I don't think that last paragraph presents our case as strongly as it could. How about this? I think we should say something about wine and cheese. Perhaps. Yeah, give me, mate. Now throw in a stack of biscuits and we'll have a party. Almost all the growth in the computer industry in the last decade happened in one place. The desktop. And of course that means Apple. This being 1997, some people feel the Apple II concept is getting old. We don't agree. The Apple II VSOP, the computer for the new millennium. Very smooth old processor. And today at Apple Computer, another milestone. This is the 50 millionth Macintosh produced since 1984. And in the last 10 years, we've made a lot of big improvements and some small ones too. Presenting the Vista Mac. The Vista Mac 2, a new thinner profile. Of course, the classic Macintosh design is as recognizable as the Coke bottle, uh, Pepsi bottle. Computer speed doubles every two years, computer memory doubles every two years. Thirty-two times the speed, thirty-two times the RAM, and one-tenth the parts. Weird. So I told my wife, this is the 90s. We do more with less, right? You don't believe me? Open up your computer. What's in there? Nothing. There's nothing in there. We build them simply, so they're simple to fix. Model 2 is about to fail. Your key operator has been notified on the Apple Fix link. Replacement should take about three minutes. I don't get it. What'd I do wrong here? Please plug in the keyboard. Oh. A computer that talks is no big deal. A computer that really listens, that's a breakthrough. I'm afraid I'll push the wrong button and damage something. How long have you had this feeling? Apple computers have always been friendly, but we've gone from friendly to understanding. Good morning. This is October 5th, 1997. I have checked four wire services, scanned eight magazines and 18 newspapers, and accessed the New York, Tokyo, and Paris databases. Here are three items you may be interested in. For a complicated system like this, I usually need a little help. Now you'll need financial management with 83 workstations, two domestic sites and two international, sub-networks within each site. Yes, and I'll need mainframe access throughout. 
Here's a possible configuration. We installed one like it last October. Hmm, how's it working out? Hello, I'm Stephen Smith, Vice President of Intercon. Our Apple Financial Management System has revolutionized the way we do business in just six months. It helped our bank buy it. <laughs> Custom design and manufacturing really had an impact on how sales does its job. The specifications are turned into a design at the technology center. Time between customer input and product output has been compressed. We cover the world, not just selling, but designing and manufacturing. One of six worldwide technology centers, the Iceland facility will design and build computers for Arctic markets. One thing that hasn't changed since 1987, growth. When Apple computer revenue broke $5 billion back in 1991, John Scully's reaction was characterized as that of a Cheshire cat grin. Today, Apple computer revenue broke the $20 billion mark. Scully had this reaction. In other news, Jack Tramiel opened a new restaurant today. I wanted Apple to be the world's business leader in finance, manufacturing, marketing, and R&D for the 90s. We all expected Apple to become big, very big but without becoming big business. In 1987, the people at Apple didn't completely understand the significance of their work, but they suspected it might turn out to be very important. What can I say? Now we know they were right. A lot has changed in the last decade, but a lot hasn't changed. In 1997, Apple is still a company with vision, and the Apple vision is stronger than ever. When you drag an icon over to hard disk in order to have it copy, supposing you make a mistake and do it twice. But Just consider using a computer and you'll soon find you've got questions. Thousands of Apple computer users across the country are also finding answers. Answers from people meeting together to get the most from their computers and themselves. People like you. If you really want to find out about how to use the device you're interested in, whatever it is, get involved with, with other people that do the same kinds of things. That's natural. We're talking about Apple computers. And the people that come to our meetings and are involved in our meeting and, and in our group are very interested in how to use an Apple computer. They all follow their personal interests. They have what, whatever their goals are, they follow them. So they develop an expertise in each of those paths. Each of those people then can share. So there's one of those people someplace that you can select or, or talk to that can help you with your choices. It's not a hobbyist type of an organization. It's a group where people come together and share ideas that help them be more productive in business. And I think that's the big difference. It is uh, good information that is relatively inexpensive. It's practically free if you know the right people in the group. And it's just, it's just a good source of knowledge. I purchased the Mac because it seemed to be the most friendly and easiest to get involved with. But I still didn't know what, uh, what RAM meant and what ROM meant. And it was wonderful to go to a user group and be able to say, you know, I really feel silly because all of these ads talk about so much ROM and so much RAM. Can somebody tell me what that means? And somebody very patiently explained that RAM is random access memory and what that does. Uh, and from that I've developed an incredible expertise. More than 850 Apple user groups exist across the country, supporting users in home, education, government, and business use. When I came to Herring Newman, I already had the Macintosh and I brought it with me. The user group has really helped me in developing other sources of, of software, or other software that would be appropriate for the group, uh, for the office here. Our time billing 
is a software product uh, that I learned of through the, the Downtown Business Users Group. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the September Macintosh Downtown Business Users Group uh, meeting. People participating in Apple user groups represent a rich variety of backgrounds, specializations, and interests. For business people, an important user group function is making connections among people with related skills and finding the best professional resources for their computers. In terms of PageMaker, I certainly am probably one of the more experienced people in the group and people call me up all the time and ask me questions. But there are other aspects of it that I'm not as versed on. Like last week I had to do something in Illustrator and I was on the phone in five minutes. <laughs> How do I get such and such to move? And uh, so it's kind of a back and forth thing. Nobody's an expert on everything. Everybody has their little niche. So I have mine and so do other people and I know who to turn to when I need it. A majority of the people who come to our group come because they use the machine at work, not because it's a home toy or a fun thing. There are lots of small business users, there are government workers, there are people in uh, armed forces. What they come for is to make better use of the programs that they have, learn tricks. Like lots of people need to design forms. And if they talk to other people who've already done this, it can cut down the amount of time it takes to learn a program to do a specific task. User groups also reach out to users in university environments. Welcome to the Stanford Macintosh Users Group. Uh, I'm Barry Annan, and uh, we're going to start with a half an hour question and answer session. The university is very involved in uh, computing, obviously very involved in uh, Macintoshes, but we get a, a broad uh, input and a lot of uh, good ideas because of, of the diversity of people here at the university. The other thing is that we're very close to the uh, Palo Alto community and so we also share that. University user groups serve the needs of a wide variety of different Apple owners and draw on the special resources of their communities to do so. This is the information line for the Arizona Apple User Group, as Apple Monthly meetings are always on the second Saturday, and our next meeting is September the 12th. The most common Apple User Groups are community groups. These groups have something to offer users with all kinds of interests. Well, when I bought my computer, I tended to use it like my car. I turn the key on and just go. I don't know how it works, I just use it. Okay. But I wanted, I had a lot of questions about why do I do this and how do I do that and so on. And anytime I had a question, there was somebody there who could answer it and give me all the information I wanted. This is really an important part of what we're all about, what a user group is. The people that, um, that want to learn how to turn a computer on. How do you plug it in? What's a, what's a disk driver? Or all those questions. And, uh, well, I got it home, but I haven't hooked it up. It's in a closet, you know, and I couldn't, you know. So uh, those are the kind of people we really want to be able to, to have get a benefit from our group. Adults aren't the only people benefiting from user group activity. Most user groups welcome children's participation, and many offer special assistance with their computing needs. How many of you are familiar with a program called Seven Cities of Gold? Hmm? So you have three ships. How many men do you want to put on each ship? Fifty. The wide variety of people participating in user groups ensures that users of all levels and with all interests can find the answers they need. You can learn from books, but you can't learn all the nuances that you can just by talking to people. And I think you often learn easier, faster, and appreciate it more when you learn from people. Certainly the books are going to help you as a point of reference. But sometimes you read through a book and they say, gee, it just doesn't, I don't understand what that's trying to say. And you talk to an individual, and if they say something you don't quite understand, you say, could you rephrase that? And it's right there. It just comes right back to you. And immediately, you've got the situation. You can grasp it. You know, a floppy disk is this round little piece of plastic inside a hard plastic casing. A hard disk is a round piece of plastic inside a bigger casing with a machine that, that spins it around. First-time computer users can also come to user groups for answers. 
Many offer classes to help new members get up and running, like this class on AppleWorks for the Apple II. User group meetings and classes offer individualized support to Apple II and Macintosh users. But user groups offer much more than that. For Apple users, group events and activities are news. Through user group newsletters, members stay in touch with each other and with current developments of all kinds. The newsletter is the primary method of communication within a user group outside of the meeting. The newsletter affords uh, the opportunity for a bit more of a in-depth or meaningful perhaps conversation or transfer of information. The BBS or bulletin board system allows members to telephone in through their computers to receive and leave messages. And then once you call uh, using your computer and some terminal program, say, you find out information, transfer files, post messages, and generally exchange information. It's sort of like an electronic mi miniature version of the clubhouse. Non-commercial public domain software applications, accessories, templates, and games is also available to user group members at little or no charge. User groups are a resource for members looking for creative new tools and a forum for developers looking for feedback on the software and other products they produce. If you could uh, specify a point here and a point there, that's where I want the text that I'm typing in right now to go. And then, and then, we came here to get direct feedback from users of Macintosh CAD software about what they like and don't like about the software they're using now and what they wish could be incorporated into a CAD package for the Macintosh. Um, and we're early enough now in our development uh, of our package that we'll be able to incorporate their suggestions directly into what we're doing. Many Apple dealers are themselves active user group members. Well, I do it all the time as I work with corporate customers. I tell them that if they really want to learn more about the machine, make it productive, and meet people that do what they do, they should come to Debug because there are, there's such a large group of people here now, and there's so many special interest groups that they can get their questions answered and solve problems and save probably hours of time. Apple actively supports its user groups through the User Group Connection, a program that communicates with user groups to bring the most up-to-date information about Apple products to people like you. But I, did, I admit that I felt a little bit apprehensive when I first went, just wondering if it would be like going into an auto parts store and trying to ask for a spark plug and feeling embarrassed because you don't know exactly what you're asking for. And it turned out it wasn't like that at all, and people are people don't condescend. I like the networking because while you may not have, you just certainly don't have all of the answers, I mean through the various SIGs you'll meet someone that you might be able to call up at 8 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night when, you, when you're actually working on a specific program. It would be good to join a group because it will give you a lot of information about computers and how to program. Or if you are new to a computer, you can learn very quickly. I've never had anybody go to a meeting that hasn't thanked me for inviting them to the users group meeting. To find the user group nearest you, call Apple's toll-free number 800-538-9696, extension 500. I'm different and I don't care who knows it. Something about me, not the same, yeah I'm different, and that's how it goes Ain't gon' play your dumb old game I got a different way of walking I got a different kind of smile I got a different way of talking Drive the women kind of wild don't care who knows it. At Apple, we build tools that help ordinary people do extraordinary things. But sometimes it's more important to help extraordinary people do ordinary things. I'm different, and I don't care who knows it. 
They ain't gonna play your dumb old game Sean Fahey, and I like dinosaurs. I am writing a report about dinosaurs on my computer at home. It's lots of fun to learn how to use the computer, and there's lots of games and graphic things you can do on it, and you can make posters like this. I like the fact that you can come in here and people can give you ideas on your project, and you can give them ideas on theirs, and you can get your project just a little bit better. Because of the club, we can work and use computers at school and for those of us who do have them at home we learn how to use them better. I really like dinosaurs so I thought well maybe if I run out of information I can use my own information like the old theories and new theories. Some of the new theories are... Uh, there's an old proverb that says give a man a fish and you feed him for the day but give that same man, teach that same man how to fish and he'll never be hungry again. When we're, these skills that we're showing children in grades one and they can do binary skills and, and word processing and, and beautiful stories and databases and, and take those databases and make them into games, uh, their they're learning after that is, is just diffusing, diffusing and differentiating and uh, dazzling and delighting, I guess. <laughs> The Apple Computer Clubs is really unique in that they bend over backwards in trying to support their teachers uh, through different competitions that they sponsor, contests for the children throughout to recognize them. And everybody likes recognition. And in, boy, you could really get it at Apple Computer Clubs. I'd like to thank the Apple Company for helping us show that the Apple Computer can take part in a real human experience. It can show love and do a lot for mankind. Thank you very much. For thousands of Apple Computer Clubs, the annual merit competition is an opportunity to gain national recognition and support for their work. Now in its fifth year, Apple Computer Clubs is bringing the personal computer into the lives and communities of teachers, students, and their families. The competition was just marvelous. The children wanted to do everything. In this age, more and more children are getting computers at home. Having the computer at home and the computer club, the children could go between the home and school. We could integrate the learning. Uh, it was, as an educator, it was a marvelous experience. The most unique thing about the Worcester Country School Computer Club is that everybody wants to join. I get parents calling up all the time. I used to limit it just to sixth graders, but now, with so many parents calling up, everybody in the school is a member of the Apple Computer Club. What I do is I set up the club and I use the students' enthusiasm. We divide all the students into committees, and they take charge. They make sure that all the students are doing the work. The motivation on this has been fantastic. It, we started it... Um, just doing one activity a week and the children beg to do two or three. Teachers really don't have much difficulty running an Apple Computer Club. If a teacher has enthusiasm, that's really all the teacher needs. What Apple does is to give the teachers guidelines how can the computer be used in the classroom or in extracurricular activities. Apple has a challenge handbook, a regular handbook, sends out, Apple sends out newsletters. There's so many different materials available. One of my favorite things, however, is the toll-free number. Whenever I have questions about what our club should be doing or how we should be doing a project, I call that number and get all of the answers I need. This year, our com community service project was working with the Assateague National Seashore. Our children went down to Assateague and worked with the natural resource staff. They had carried on an information campaign about erosion and also about the wild ponies on Assateague Island. Danny and I drew a um, model of what the, on the Macintosh of what the beaches would be like um, after they pump all the sand on into them. 
And it was also fun because we got to meet congressmen and important people like the Rangers at Assateek. One of the most exciting things about the computer world is that the children become the teachers in this age. And whenever we did something wrong, then she'd come over and help. And whenever she messed up, then we'd come over and help her. We'd have to go help the teacher. The reason I joined Apple Computer Clubs in the beginning was because of the support that Apple provides for teachers. I was especially impressed with the challenge program, with the notebook that was provided, with all the activities, and especially the thousands of ideas. I think the thing that makes me the happiest about the computer club program is the fact that I see students at the beginning of the year who don't know anything about computers, who aren't able to use it, and they are able to make the connection by the end of the year that, that the computer is a tool and that it's fun and it's exciting to use. And for the first time in their life, they've done something with word processing. They've been able to, to write it, to edit it, to correct it, and to read it. Towards the night before mid-quarters and all through the school, every teacher was pondering all the classroom rules, checking all the grades the teachers did do to make sure no student would cry, oh boo-hoo. Well, I like it because you can come in here and you can work on almost anything that you'd want to. Yeah, I've learned how to program things and how to do other things on the computers that I would have never even guessed how to do before this class. She really lets us have a lot of freedom and I can do so much more with the freedom that I have in here than any other class. With the flexibility of the club program, our students are able to work in all different types of areas. We have students that are interested in logo, we have students that are interested in low-res graphics programming or basic programming, and students who are interested just in using print shop or in working with word processing. Some of our parents also have purchased computers for their students to use, I believe, as a result of the student involvement in Apple Computer Clubs. This allows the students at home to use the computer, and then they uh, receive additional practice. One of the benefits of Apple Computer Clubs that I really like is the opportunity to work with students outside of a formal classroom setting. We were recently featured in a newspaper article about fortune cookie sayings. Life is a symphony. It just depends on how you conduct it. Don't let school get in the way of your education. May your life be as useful as an Apple computer. The Apple Computer Club has given us a chance to show other teachers and, and other schools that the computer itself is not just a machine, that it is something that can be very much a part of the children's lives. Well, the project has been helping a little seventh grade boy who has leukemia, and we were asked to help him. And so they all decided they would like to adopt him as our student of the year. And so we have been spending lots of time sending cards and making banners and badges and trying to give Joe some love so that he will keep with him and make him happy. This is a very valuable project for South Whittier School. We are a little school in comparison to other communities. And this has given our kids a chance to uh, do something with the computer itself that is very meaningful to them. They have not had computers in their home. And to come to the lab and know that they can uh, work on the challenges and work on the project for Joe and write him letters and uh, work with the other kids means more to them than anything else in this world. This club meant a lot to me. It gave me a lot of new experiences in how to deal with somebody like this and how to help somebody out like this. Making the banners, greeting cards, visiting him, it's something, it's, it's can't explain, it's, it's a beautiful experience. These children need this type of support. They need the self-esteem that this will help give to them. They have never been on number one before, and uh, to have something this thrilling happen to them is probably something they will carry with them the rest of their lives. And what more can we give our children? Nothing is impossible if you try. You'll be sure to work it out by and by. Apple and Apple Computer Clubs have let me live the American dream. 
And when I won that first Apple computer, you can't t tell uh, how happy I felt. And each year was another one, and, and now I have three. I feel I have my own computer lab, <laughs> and, and Apple helped me do that. Other educators should know that it's not difficult to start an Apple computer club. My advice is try it. Some of the new theories are that the brontosaurus did not like swamps and dinosaurs were warm-blooded. I don't know why scientists think that, but they do think it. And also, I thought maybe someday I'd start writing this book about space. Dad! Just a second, Martin. Mom, come on. Be out in a minute. Hey! And you're not fair. I'm busy, Martin. I don't care. I'm coming in. Don't you dare. An Apple II GS can do over 10,000 things for your family. My computer. Maybe even teach them to share. Mom. Every day of every week of every month this year, thousands of people will bring home a personal computer. Every single day. Chances are some of those people will come to feel disappointed in the computer they chose. Maybe they wound up with less than they really needed or didn't get the support they really wanted. Maybe their computer doesn't do enough. Or maybe it's just too hard to get it to do anything. At the same time, there are many other people who feel very good indeed about owning a computer. They keep finding better ways to use it, more ways to enjoy it, and new ways to improve it. You might call these people lucky, but they'll be the first to tell you that luck has nothing to do with it. Because when you come right down to it, knowing whether or not to buy a personal computer, or even knowing which computer to choose, only takes a little common sense and some good advice. So for the next few minutes, you'll be hearing just that, common sense and good advice. And you'll be hearing it from real computer owners, people who will tell you in their own words why they did what they did and what they found once they did it. Well, we were kind of a quiet, typical American family and kind of passive and then the computer came along. I just don't know how we would exist without it. I'd run away from my parents and find somebody with a computer. <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't do that. The three of them became violent, <laughs> semi-violent. <laughs> well, no, I was in genealogy before I knew I know about you were, but I thought you were in love with your computer now. Oh, I am in love with my computer. <laughs> I can't get them off the computer. It's a family war at the computer, I guess. He said, what are you going to use it for? And I said, I'm not going to use it. The kids are going to use it. The kids can't go through life being computer illiterates. And I have a lot of paperwork. I'm a, a collector of paper. And I was trying to find a way in order to get rid of some of the clutter, which my husband doesn't really like. I raise registered Angus cattle, show cattle, on the farm. I need a method to keep records of their pedigrees and their performance, their offspring. We needed uh, something to help us budget our, uh, organize our budget. And he said, this just came in. It's a, a first personal computer. He says, um, I don't know how it works. I don't even know how to put it together. But I do know that it's going to change the world. And he was so excited about it that I caught that enthusiasm. I first decided to get involved with computers because I saw a lot of kids who knew about, a lot more about them than I did. And um, I realized that it was a technology that was really affecting music a lot and there were a lot of possibilities. I became interested in using a computer in the first place by joining a group connected with our genealogy society. And Mim, after a while, she said, oh, geez, she says, uh, it's the wave of the future. We have to do it. Just sort of doing stuff, computer games and stuff. Do you have a favorite, Nate? Muppet keyboard. <laughs> you do our accounting, too. Yeah, I do all, all of our bookkeeping, all the accounting. 
input all the checks, you know, for our checking account, balances them. It makes reconciling bank statements very easy. You know, at the end of the month, instantly, exactly how insolvent you are. <laughs> I just felt like I was sort of on cloud nine. Using the computer, it was so much easier than using the typewriter. Well, what I mainly use is the word processing program, which I find uh, is really good. I do a lot of letters. I started using it as a journal, and I found that I have been keeping a journal for about 20 years, writing one. And it was so wonderful to be able to go upstairs and type out thoughts for five minutes. Yeah, I write poetry on it. I, I uh, communicate with a lot of friends, actually, just for personal uh, use. I make letterheads. I make lists. I keep track of all kinds of activities in my life. I only use part of the spreadsheet. I use it for lists of uh, business contacts and things like that. One of the programs that I use uses a, a video camera, which I thought was really handy. I, if I have a problem drawing a, let's say, a car, for example, at a certain angle, with this video camera, I can go out and take the uh, shot of the video, or the shot of the car, and um, it appears on the computer, and then I can draw from there. I'm a typical adult. I use about 10% of the computer, uh, like I do with my mind. Uh, I don't explore as much as the kids do. We have invested in some educational software for the kids and we didn't actually buy any until after the kids had really learned their shapes and their colors and most of their numbers. Our kids were three, I think, and were in preschool um, when we got our first educational software. Actually, some of it was a gift. The things I like about the computers most are the games. Now, in a way, I, I kind of disagree because I think the educational games are pretty good themselves, you know. They turn it into a game, but then, like, the, kid, the kids really don't realize that they're learning, but they are. You can make banners and cards and signs. Make, make cards. I think that's how you learned how to write your name, isn't it, on the computer? We live in Kansas City, Missouri, and we use our home computer to make this newspaper. Right, Tony? Yes. I yell, Christy, what's four times four? It's, oh, 16, you know. And then when she tells her teacher at school, Kristen, how'd you learn all this? You know, teacher's surprised. The grammar and speller programs are excellent because children tend to not want to take the time. And this forces them to take a look at their mistakes. Her friends are interested, and she has a lot of her friends over. They come over and they do group projects together on it. I uh, do my homework on it. I've done two reports on it. And I made a baseball score sheet for our other computer. And I was afraid he could never write in longhand again. That was a big concern I had. But as a result of his work with this uh, computer, when he is writing in longhand, I find it to be more careful, more concise. And the most cool thing about this computer is that the computer talks. I mean, there's not very many computers in the world that can talk, but I'm glad that there are some that do. It just goes into her mind. She doesn't realize it, that she's having fun. Well, she realizes she's having fun, but she doesn't realize that she's learning. I think I checked maybe six stores before I finally bought one. The first store I visited, I had a difficult time with the gal that was uh, the girl salesman. Salesperson. A salesperson. Uh, it seemed like she just wanted to sell the computers. And I was uh, uh, blitzed and uh, ritzed and uh, made to feel uh, uh, like I was what I am, uh, a moron in this business. And uh, I responded uh, uh, the way I think most people. I walked out of the store. But there were other dealers in the city who did give us support, no matter what kind of support we needed. And, of course, I needed a great deal of support. I just hate shopping. But it was, it was a good experience. I learned a lot about computers and what they could do from talking to salespeople. All our computers since that first purchase have been with a dealer and they, they walk you through it uh, through the programs almost handhold you showing you how everything can be done and how you can use it to the maximum advantage so uh, I think the most important thing is a, a good dealer. The one I purchased was very expandable 
I started out with a simple monitor. Uh, I'm no computer expert. I still am not. Basically, yeah. the word processing equipment. And we've since added... An external disk drive. Right. And, and a, a keypad, because a lot of a my... A calculator keypad. And later, we added the mouse right. and a joystick for games. We needed to send things by uh, the modem, uh, and we needed to print things out. We needed to have a decent printer that printed at a decent, uh, you know, decent rate. So um, when we get when we put everything together, the the cost of it wasn't the major factor. Well, at first I thought this is an awful lot of money to be spending on something that I don't know anything about, and I don't know how I'm going to use it. Still considered them somewhat of a luxury. I wasn't totally convinced we needed one. I says, wow, where are we going to get the money? I says, we're into so many other collectible things, and this might be another fad or something. Now, I felt when we first bought the computer that, oh, I don't know whether we should be spending this money or everything, but now I feel it's a necessity. I, it cuts down our on time. I, my time is very important with these two children, and I really use it a lot to... What, sweetie? Kevin wanted a computer so much that he saved his own money and, and actually bought the computer that he's got. I put it, half of it on my credit card and just figured I'd pay for it somehow. And I'm really glad that I did now because it turned out that it's paid for itself several times over. Um, and now I'm using it for so many things I never thought I would. When I got it home, I was really excited and I put it on, because I didn't have my room. I just redid my room and I have a place for my computer. So I put it on the dining room table and I just like worked and worked and worked. But it, it took me about a half an hour to finally get it all together so I understood like what it meant. I brought it home. I immediately took it out of the boxes, hooked it right up. It was very simple to hook up. And I had about five kids in the house and they all just had to play with it. <laughs> uh, to set up the computer uh, was very simple. Uh, it probably took me two hours. When I got home, I was petrified that you were going to have broken it. Yeah, well, Adam was didn't about... read the instructions. Right, and, but it was very simple, and Adam had already thrown the mouse all the way across the room, and I was scared it was going to break, but it's virtually impossible well, to break. Mouse. The, yeah, the, the, the mouse? The mouse, the, the mouse thing button. you use to operate the computer. Then I uh, managed to get it upstairs and find an old bench I could set it on, and uh, got the printer hooked up that night. Oh, it was real easy. My dad told me to read the books. I still haven't even read them. I took it home, put it on my table, and disassembled it. I went to see what was inside, really. He took it apart. And then I thought to myself, by golly, I really should have turned it on to see if it worked first. <laughs> that's what I did. If you want to buy a computer, the first thing you should do is talk to me. I'm very enthusiastic on support of computers, and... By the use by everything from a child of three years of age to a senior citizen. And I don't want anybody to say, I can't learn computers. I guess what I would tell somebody when they were going out to buy a computer would be a couple things. One is to make sure you know what you want to use it for. It's probably the biggest thing that I run into with people mm -hmm. who I know who've gotten computers. They buy something that's either not big enough for what they want or too big. I think it'd be very easy to just uh, make up a laundry list of, of what you want this computer to do for you and then uh, go out, check out all the computers, and make sure that the, that the list um, is matched up with the computer. Uh, I think if you wanted to buy a computer, you would have to consider uh, the quality of the product, how long is it going to last, what kind of maintenance does it need, and where can you get that maintenance? I would first talk to my friends and neighbors, people that you work with, find out, you know, some of the problems that they've had, what they've run into, you learn from their mistakes. Find somebody, a friend you trust, who can walk you through what the different components are. Do you need a hard disk? Do you need a letter quality printer? Do you, do you need, you know, exactly what kinds of things do you need? And then you should also know what kind of software you're going to need and, I, and how to, like, what kind of questions to ask the salesperson at the store you're buying. I usually tell my friends uh, who ask me if I, advice about buying a computer to buy as much as they can. A lot of people think, well, they don't really need this uh, second disk drive or a printer, but uh, especially a printer. The printer is so important because it allows you to print out your letters right away. You can use print shop and feel success with a computer, and I think that's important. I could live without my computer, but life would not be as full. I really enjoy it. It, it is more like a hobby that is turned into a tool that I really like to use.
I went back to school this year and I don't think I could have gotten a good grade on the course I took going back to college after being out of school for 20 years if I hadn't had that computer. It just saved me so much time on my papers and I came out of that with a course with an A and I think that computer was basically uh, did 50% of the work. I think it's opened up a, a whole new world for Jim uh, who always I think had a flair for writing but had no way to express that. I'm sure everybody's bought something at a certain point in their lives that they spend all this money on and then it just sits on the shelf. And the computer for me has not turned out to be that way. I use it every day and I couldn't live without it at this point. I started off uh, using the computer for games and I find that it's been, you know, a godsend in, in trying to get me organized. And having two kids and working full time, I really find that organization is a key word in my life. Um, so I, I find that I've gotten so used to <laughs> uh, using the computer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... <laughs> Can you come back here? Since I started using a computer, my personal boundaries have become the size of the planet. I'm, I'm communicating with people in over 20 countries now, and in a real intimate way, every day. Uh, we talk about professional things, we talk about personal things, marriages, births, deaths, uh, business activities, the works. It's just a normal... It's a normal way to extend yourself out to the limits of the world. It was like almost a magical thing for me uh, because every day I'm finding more and more things to do with a computer and it, it's just amazing. It, one thing leads to another. And I ran into a guy in all places in Cutla, Maine. Now you can't get to Cutla, Maine. There's a lot of people that would be absolutely convinced that Cutla, Maine is a mirage. And I actually met one of the natives there when I thought I was doing well in the computer world. And he had a modem, and he was hooked up to CompuServe. And I couldn't stand the thought of that bucolic idiot getting ahead of me. So I went out and bought one. And I'm groping with it. And there's a whole world out there. There's university databases that I can plug into. CompuServe could bankrupt me just with their marvelous services. And I'm gonna get wired, and I'm gonna be able to transmit files and receive them, and I'm gonna go back to Cutlemain if I'm ever able to find it again, and I'm gonna tell that guy, to you. Not too long ago, you had a lot of questions about personal computers. You wondered how you'd shop for one, how you could use one, how you'd get up to speed on one. Since then, you've heard some pretty good answers. But as we all know, one good answer can sometimes lead to a whole new set of questions. So now we'd like to offer you one last bit of advice. Before you bring home any computer, Ask all your questions where you're most likely to find all the answers. And where might that be? We know just the place. No time at all, so let's get moving. First, Ivan, I know your group can make these numbers look presentable. Got it. Next, we'll need work from every department. Who's set up for that? Our computers are tied in. Great. Mike, how long for graphics? Two, three days max. Not good enough. Our computer can do it in a day. It's yours. Joni, typesetting and printing? About a week on overtime. Now, hold on now. Who published this? We did, on the computer. Well, do it again. Joe, how long for a production flowchart? We're jammed. We'll do it as fast as we can. I haven't helped them out. Last, we need presentation overheads. Any ideas? I uh, first met uh, John Scully, I guess, about four years ago when I was invited out to Apple to see a new 
product they were working on called the Macintosh. And I guess like a lot of people, I was wondering what this uh, uh, former president of Pepsi-Cola could uh, bring to the uh, personal computer industry. And in fact, uh, in the, the time that's followed, John Scully has really become a living legend in the industry. And we're really very proud to uh, have for the first time uh, at the BCS, John Scully, the President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chairman of Apple Computer. Thank you very much. I was sitting down here in the audience next to uh, a gentleman who had his uh, good-looking uh, blue suit and white shirt and uh, red tie, and he looked over at me and he said, gosh, if I knew this was an informal affair, I wouldn't have dressed up. And, and I said, you don't understand. I am dressed up. <laughs> Perhaps that's how much I've changed since I've gone to California. It really is more than 3,000 miles from East Coast corporate America to uh, high-tech Silicon Valley. And what I'd like to do this evening is to share with you some of those experiences. In fact, uh, I've just finished writing a book, and the book is called Odyssey, Pepsi to, to Apple. Uh, many times when a CEO writes a book, it's kind of looking back on their life and trying to put things together in some neat monument that uh, will not be flawed in any way because they obviously didn't make any mistakes during their career, and tells you what they have accomplished. And when I came out with a book, um, while I'm still at Apple and still uh, hopefully uh, somewhere in the, in the middle of, of my career, uh, people said, well, why did you want to write a book? Now, why didn't you wait like everybody else? Don't you understand that's what you're supposed to do? You're not supposed to talk about these kinds of things. But well, what they didn't understand was that uh, I wasn't trying to write a book about the history of Apple or the history of Pepsi uh, or my own uh, autobiography. Rather, what I was trying to do was to use these as reference points that have shaped my experience uh, just as the world has gone through a transition from the industrial age to the information society over the past 10 years. Half of that time I spent as CEO of a second wave, very successful industrial age company, Pepsi-Cola company, and the other half of that time I've spent uh, here at Apple Computer. And I think that uh, just the mere fact of being able to look at the world through two different lenses has given me the chance to at least compare and contrast the differences between those two different uh, economic concepts of the industrial age and the information society. And what I was trying to do was not to talk about what has happened, but rather to set the stage for the things that I think are possible as we move into the last years of the 20th century. And not only possible, but I would suggest necessary, because I'm concerned, as I'm sure many of you are, that here we are in America with our competitiveness in retreat, with our education priorities somewhat uh, in doubt as to whether they are the uh, right ones and whether they're well understood by those who are in policy positions to be able to make those kinds of priorities. And at a time when there seems to be a heavy dose of cholesterol uh, injected into many of our institutional systems. So what can we do to promise a better world for those who are still in college, uh, those who are young managers or middle managers and who are going to be hitting their stride as we cross over into the next century. Uh, why should they inherit uh, a world that isn't at least as good as the one which all of us inherited? And I think there's still some options that we have that are very different than those that are being presented by many of our, our leaders in government, in business, in academia, that might be considered uh, as to what we could do to make it a lot more exciting as we enter the 21st century. So that was the basic idea behind the book, but the book is uh, more than uh, just a set of ideas. Uh, it's also an adventure story, and when I wrote it, I wanted to write a book that you didn't have to be a computer expert or you didn't have to be a business expert in order to enjoy it. Because as anyone who has followed uh, the personal computer industry saga knows, 
uh, that it has been a roller coaster ride. And it's still an industry that's young enough that most of the personalities that have shaped it are still alive and well and thriving. And it's one which has become a part of the uh, American folk legend, at least in, in business terms. And uh, I felt that uh, telling the story, at least from the perspective of someone who has been one of the players on, this, on the stage, uh, would be interesting to uh, many people who still don't know very much about personal computers. I hope you can appreciate just how different it is for someone who had worked for 16 years in a large, successful corporation to move from the East Coast out to the West Coast and go to Silicon Valley. I remember the first three days that I was at Apple uh, that I went to my first off-site off down at a place called Pajaro Dunes, which is on the Pacific Ocean. And this is very different than any management meeting I'd ever been to. The meetings I had been to, uh, the agendas were carefully prepared, you know, the analysis was always done ahead of time. We sort of knew the outcome of the meetings before they even began. But this meeting was probably better described as a free-for-all because <laughs> everyone had their own opinion about what we ought to be doing and everyone wanted to talk about it all at once until the chandelier started to shake and I discovered that uh, I was in my first earthquake and someone yelled, run for the beach. And we all ran outside and ran for the beach and then someone yelled, said, wait a minute, the last time we ran for the beach we had a tidal wave, run for the dunes. <laughs> and that was kind of how we did almost everything. <laughs> and I wasn't the only one who had trouble understanding what uh, Silicon Valley was, was like and Apple in particular. I remember uh, one time uh, AT&T came out to visit Apple. They were visiting everybody in those days. And they showed up uh, in a way that they thought would make us feel comfortable. So they all came out in casual clothes. And of course, we wanted to make them feel comfortable, so we showed up in suits and ties. <laughs> it's a weird meeting. <laughs> After we reorganized Apple in 1985, a lot of people wondered whether the best of Apple would just be a series of anecdotal stories and that there wouldn't be any uh, more innovation, any more dreams, uh, that we would become a very traditional corporation and in fact even bend to the many, many people who were advising us that if we didn't adopt a clone technology and put the Apple logo on it, or if we didn't at least broadly license the Macintosh technology to everyone to be able to produce it so that somebody could get uh, a product out there that had slots, then there wasn't going to be any, any future for not only the Macintosh, but even Apple itself. We chose not to do that. We decided that uh, the best decision, the least risk decision, was not to take the safest course. Uh, that we had to tighten down our uh, internal controls, we had to run the company with uh, greater focus and greater order and discipline, but we didn't have to abandon the, the dream. And to the contrary, uh, we had to learn from the mistakes that we had made, that I had made, um, and begin to invest in the technology even more, not abandon the technology. And that's exactly what we did over the last two years. And as many of you know, we increased our research and developments from uh, something around $40 million per year up to uh, this year we'll spend, I guess we just did spend about $190 million uh, in the past year on research and development and introduced over 50 products this year alone. The success in this industry will always be based upon innovation. Uh, yes, you have to have standards, uh, but you also have to have innovative technologies that will add value and will give a reason to be able to do the kinds of things that so many of us believe in, and that is to take personal computing well beyond where it is today. One of those people who really cares a lot about where personal computing will go is Bill Atkinson. And Bill, as many of you know, is the fellow who not only did QuickDraw and did Mac Paint, uh, but also has done the remarkable work on HyperCard. HyperCard was perhaps the only technology that somehow forgot, got forgotten. Uh, almost every other technology that is in the Macintosh today has its origins in some way back in the 1960s or early 70s, long before Apple was even founded as a company. 
But the one that got forgotten was hypertext. And as we looked out to the future, to what was going to be the kind of computer that we would all personally want to have at the turn of the century, it was becoming more and more obvious that we had to have the capabilities of hypertext. We had to have the ability of organizing information by association to be able to make the computer more intuitive, to be able to address very, very large databases, and to be able to access information at a time when information would be uh, far larger in quantity than, than anything we're experiencing today. In fact, uh, it's estimated that information in quantity doubles uh, every three to four years. So we would either be overwhelmed by information by the turn of the century, or we would learn to cope with it. And hypertext was a key technology platform that we had to have in place. So about two years ago, uh, Bill Atkinson, who had been working on some ideas with hypertext, uh, decided that he could build a product. And this is a product which eventually was introduced at Macworld here in Boston in August. And it's one which has probably had uh, more excitement around it, uh, perhaps even more importance than anything that we've done since the Macintosh itself. And in fact, there are even some who think it may be uh, at least as significant, if not more significant in ways than the Macintosh in terms of what it can mean for us long, long term. But Bill was one of those very unusual people I discovered in Silicon Valley. There are dreamers and there are implementers. Uh, Bill is the kind of guy who can sit out and watch the stars at nighttime and project his mind uh, out cosmically to uh, 200 years from now, thinking about what future species may have descended from us or even from the computers that we build, uh, more or less from us, and then at the same time be able to take those kinds of ideas, turn them into incredibly innovative products, and build a shippable code and he actually go out and market the products himself. Uh, it's rare, if not uh, almost impossible, to find anybody who can do both the cosmic conceptualization all the way through to uh, shipping industrial strength code. And that's exactly what Bill Atkinson did with, with HyperCard. After Steve Jobs left Apple, uh, I was looking around to see whether the vision of the company was correct, to see uh, who I could get guidance from from a technical standpoint. And Bill Atkinson was one of the people I turned to, as was Alan Kay. Uh, Alan, uh, I was to discover, uh, was someone who wasn't just the father of many of the ideas that we use today, like small talk and, and uh, other uh, parts of the human interface that are uh, well known today with Macintosh, uh, but he was someone who was even more interested in the kinds of computers that we would have out in the future. And the Dynabook, which Alan conceived a good number of years ago, was a product that still hadn't been built. Uh, it still held concepts uh, which were yet to be realized. And as I learned more from Alan, and he became almost my uh, Buddha master, uh, I discovered that not only was the vision that Steve Jobs had uh, the correct one, that one person, one computer, uh, one person at a time was the way to change the world, but that in fact we had only begun the journey. That this wasn't the end of a fad, uh, it wasn't the phenomenon of the 1980s. Perhaps a better analogy would be to uh, project ourselves backwards to 1915 and think about the automobile industry and imagine a conversation that would go something like, uh, now that the automobile has been discovered, uh, what shall we do after the automobile? And yet we saw that there was no such thing as mass personalized transportation until we had built the infrastructure of highways, until we had a petroleum industry, until we had a dealership network, until we had service stations, until we had an aftermarket uh, of companies that could uh, supply the various uh, other add-on products and replacement uh, parts and products which uh, automobiles needed. And we had to make the technology invisible. We had to go from the era of the machine enthusiast in the automobile industry to making the technology invisible with automatic transmission, with power brakes. And that's exactly what's happening today with personal computers. You know, we are at the point where we have machine enthusiasts who love the technology, really care about what personal computing means for them, but we haven't yet seen mass personalized knowledge systems the analog to the mass personalized transportation that took some 70 years in the automotive industry. And that is going to require an infrastructure of telecommunications. It's going to require 
databases to be established that can be easily accessed regardless of their operating environments. And it's not unreasonable to expect that by the turn of this century, only some 12 years from now, that almost anything of interest in the world, whether it be in graphics, text, or sound, is going to be digitized. And in theory, it could be available and accessible, assuming that we had the proper devices to connect to it and we had the password clearances in order to, to uh, do that. So why aren't we demanding that our public education system begins to focus on developing in our young people the kinds of skills that they will need in the early 21st century in order to be successful in the world ahead and be able to maintain the innovation and creativity that we will need in order to be successfully able to add value and to keep our affluent middle class society and the world's marketplace alive and thriving. And I think that means uh, some fundamental reforms in public education and the personal computer has the chance of being more than a tool for computer literacy, more than a tool that is used in computer labs, but can become integrated in a very important way into the fabric of our learning process. And it means building the self-esteem of our teachers. It means putting a national priority on education that seems far amiss, regardless of which administration happens to be in power. It's a curious thing to me that when we look at our large institutions that are using information technology, that during the 1980s, the cost of technology has gone down dramatically on a price performance basis. And yet, the performance has gone up significantly and nobody can measure real productivity gains. The old concept of taking large mainframe computers and taking the workflow and systematizing that so that work can be done faster gave us measurable productivity for about 15 or 20 years. But more recently, doing things faster isn't enough to get measurable productivity gains. We've got to learn how to do things better. Again, I believe the solutions are going to be found by focusing on the individuals inside those institutions, whether they're corporations or schools or government. Focus on the individuals, give them enabling tools that they can work with, and help change their behavior in terms of how they think and how they work and how they communicate and how they learn. And that is really the tremendous opportunity all of us have to be part of changing the world by using personal computers to have an impact on society that goes far beyond anything that has happened so far. As we look at the technology at the 21st century, uh, I envision a product which uh, I call the Knowledge Navigator. A navigator because we're going to want to be able to navigate our way through knowledge that will allow us to bridge areas of specialization. The over-specialization that we've had in our society today has restricted creativity. We've got to be able to bridge the sciences with the humanities. And think back to the precedent of the Renaissance in the 15th century, when we had a wonderful invention in the year 1360 with the printing press, a tool that enabled individuals to be able to access knowledge, to democratize the book, the printed page. In 1360, only one out of 100 people was estimated to be able to read. 140 years later, in the year 1500, it's estimated that 80 out of 100 people could read and that books were no longer printed in Latin, but they were printed in the tongues of whatever was the spoken language at that time. It's hard to imagine whether we even have more than 80% literacy today in a highly industrialized country like the United States. That mere fact of democratizing knowledge started the Renaissance because it let people rediscover the golden age of Greece. It let them see a world through a series of perspectives that bridged the humanities and the arts and the mathematics and the philosophies and opened up a bandwidth of, of knowledge that was unknown during the Dark Ages. As we go into the 21st century, we are going to have to open up our own bandwidths and to move out of the dark ages of over-institutionalization and over-specialization. And we want at least an equivalent tool to the printing press. 
What is exciting to me is to see that when you go to the universities today, that you realize that it takes about 10 to 15 years for technology to incubate from the time that it's first discovered and invented until it appears in commercial products. That's about the time it's taken for many of the technologies that we had in the Apple II and in the Macintosh uh, to incubate and come out into commercial products that all of us are using today. Well, if that's true, it means that the technologies that are in the universities right now, the technologies that are in the laboratories, whether it's Apple Computer or other companies, that those are the technologies that we're probably going to see in products around the turn of the century, just 12 years from now. And I believe that all of the key technologies we need are already in place, uh, starting to evolve, you know, and will converge together around the turn of the century to give us a descendant of the Macintosh that will be even more intuitive and easy to use, one that will be even more powerful because it will include artificial intelligence capabilities. It will be one which will have extensive uh, networking capabilities regardless of the operating environments or where databases may reside. Uh, probably very sophisticated object-oriented distributed database technologies, an extension of the object-oriented uh, concepts that we're using today in our, our personal computers. And that we will have merged together the series of different uh, things like uh, video imaging uh, with text and sound windows, graphics uh, generated through simulation on a computer, so that we will have a true multimedia environment, an environment for learning tools, an environment for communication tools, an environment for work tools. And I believe that the multimedia environment will open up some extraordinary possibilities to return to the earlier theme of, of education. We're not competing with our personal computers today against books. We're competing against special effects in films. We're competing against MTV. We're competing against video arcade games for share of mind with our young people, because those are the real alternatives. So why can't we begin to take the idea that work can be fun, an idea that seemed contrarian to me and totally unconventional when I moved from the East Coast corporate America world that I had grown up to, to Silicon Valley, and yet today is one that makes so much sense to me. Because if you're having fun, you're probably doing something that's interesting to you. And if you're doing something that's interesting, you're probably going to have a better chance of coming up with doing things in a better way and being more productive than if you're doing something that's boring. And why shouldn't the same thing be true in learning as it is in work? Why shouldn't we make the process of learning as entertaining as it is to go to a film or go uh, play with a video arcade game? And I think that's totally going to be within our grasp with uh, the knowledge navigator concept of, of personal computing around the turn of the, of the century. What it validates for me is the vision that Focusing on the individual, enabling the individual with tools is going to be just as valid in the 21st century as it was back in 1977 when Apple was founded. It's not that this was a nifty idea for the 80s that somehow will exhaust itself, but it's that we are at the beginning of something which has only begun to touch people's lives, not just in the United States, but right across the world. And that is the kind of vision which excites us at Apple, because we came to Apple to change the world, we came to Apple to personally make a difference, and we came to Apple to learn and grow. Those are the only three promises we make an employee when they join our company. We don't promise lifetime uh, uh, tenure. We don't promise pensions. Uh, we don't promise it'll be easy. What we do promise is that you will have an absolutely extraordinarily incredible experience and that you will be part of an adventure. And when I say come to Apple, I don't mean just to sign up and have a badge and walk into our offices in Cupertino or any of our offices in other parts of the world. I mean in the greater Apple family because what makes the third wave, the first wave was agrarian, the second industrial, the third wave is information society, what makes the third wave really different is that we no longer have corporations trying to be completely self-sufficient on their own. We no longer measure success by how large 
an independent a company is, we measure success by how innovative, how flexible, how high the quality standards are, and how well it is networked into interdependencies with other independent organizations. In our case, we have tremendous interdependencies. We have interdependencies with dealers, with software developers, with vendors of our piece parts and components. And perhaps most importantly, as we discovered in 1985, when many thought Apple was on the brink of extinction, you didn't. You, know, you the enthusiasts, understood that while we may not have been doing everything right in running our company, that the dream was essentially correct and the technologies were sound and the products with some modifications and more openness you know, could meet the needs of the marketplace. And you stuck with us. And that was probably as important in assuring that Apple made it through those tough times as anything else that I can think of. It's that network of relationships that makes the third wave companies so different from the second wave giants that we've seen in industrial America in the past. Well, I've talked a lot about some of the impressions that I've had in coming to Apple. You've seen a little bit of uh, what we still do today, and yes, we still have fun. Uh, there still is no dress code at Apple, and there still are beer busts on Friday afternoons, and we still celebrate milestones. And yes, we are a larger, more complex business. Uh, we're different in many ways as well. We sell into business uh, with much greater emphasis than we did a, a few years ago, and today we're doing it with some success. But we're still a company driven by a dream. And even as IBM starts to look more like Apple with user interface and three and a half inch diskettes, and Apple seems to look more like IBM as we you know, put on our suits and ties and go into corporate America through the front door, and <laughs> we actually get in a few these days. <laughs> We're not turning into Ford and Chevy. The visions of the two companies are as different and distinct now as they ever were. I believe that IBM is focused on a vision of institutional productivity, customer control, and trying to build upon the very strong reputation it has as an outstanding service organization. It's one of the great companies in the world, without a question of a doubt. But the vision at Apple is a very different one. It's one that focuses on the individual. And it, rests on one simple idea, and that idea is that the way to change the world is to give people tools to help them change their behavior, to have the epicenter on the individual, not the epicenter on the mainframe. The personal computer isn't just a smaller version of the giant ones that came before it. The personal computer is the doorway into information technology for individuals, and therefore you've got to treat it with all the respect that it deserves. You can't compromise on the technology. You've got to make it as intuitive as possible without compromises. And these are the, the dreams that are as important to Apple as we go out into the 1990s as they were when we defined the Macintosh or we defined the Apple IIe or the Apple IIgs. Now, these are the things that are at the roots of the value of Apple Computer, and they won't change, regardless of how much else changes in the industry ahead. Well, thank you very much for the chance to be able to visit with you and talk tonight. Uh, I'd be happy to answer a few questions if you have. And it's a great pleasure to cross the country and be 3,000 miles away from home and yet feel that I'm still amongst friends. Thank you very much. We've been talking it over, and we agree that on the basis of the work, it's easily the best presentation we've seen. We'd like to award you the account, but frankly, there's a problem. What's that? You agreed to keep this assignment confidential. I don't understand. Obviously, you brought in freelance artists, typesetters. You might as well hold a press conference. Now, hold on, hold on. All the work we've shown you was done by the people in this room on a computer. What computer puts out work like this? Hire us and we'll tell you.
And now, breaking through from the Apple News Center, it's Apple News Break Update. Tonight with Mary Diltz in the studio and Gary Williams in the field in Cupertino. Good evening. Our top news story comes to us from Apple Computer in Cupertino, California. To continue that history of breaking through, Apple announced today their exciting new product, HyperCard. Our news update team was at Apple today and found out that HyperCard is a personal toolkit for creating, customizing, or using information the way you want. HyperCard is an information hub. It uses files known as stacks, which contain cards of related information, such as a stack of address cards. Cards represent information that can be made up of text and graphics. Cards also have buttons, and it is when you click on these buttons that the process all begins. And HyperCard can take you to any card of related information in the same stack, or even to other stacks. No other tool matches HyperCard's power and ease of use for applications requiring the linking of various kinds of information. To learn more about HyperCard, we talked earlier with its creator, Bill Atkinson. We found Bill getting ready for Macworld and asked him about his brainchild, just what it is and why. I view um, sort of the Macintosh has the operating system at the bottom, or the hardware at the bottom, then the operating system, and then the toolbox, the menus and quick draw and windows, mouse handling stuff, um, and then sort of a big gap, and then programmers up there who make it accessible using the toolbox to customers. And somewhere in between the programmer and the toolbox needs to be a layer that allows customers to get their hands on the capability of the Macintosh. That's what HyperCard can do. Well, now that we're intrigued, I'd like to go now to our technical reporter who's over at Apple, Gary Williams. Hi, Mary. I'm here in Cupertino covering the excitement of today in HyperCard. I interrupted you because you were talking about browsing, and I thought it might be easier to show everyone right here on the screen just how it works. To start the whole process, you just double-click on the HyperCard icon, and we bring up the first card, which is known as the Home Card. Mary, this is like a directory for all your HyperCard stacks. It's on this Home Card that all the icons you see are actually buttons, and by simply clicking an icon, you access the stack pictured. You can always return to the home card from any card just by clicking on the home icon, which looks like a small house. HyperCard presents information on cards just like index cards and even has full Mac Paint menus for creating graphics. What I feel makes HyperCard so special, though, is that it enables us to link any piece of information on one card to information on other cards. You link cards to organize information in absolutely whatever way is most useful to you. When you talk about browsing and retrieving information, it goes like this. Let's say you often travel on business to foreign countries, and you need instant access to comprehensive information about those countries. Recently, you've been assigned to go to France, and you need some answers to common questions like how to convert dollars to francs, what the weather is this time of year, and what kind of transportation is available. What do you do? The solution is HyperCard. All you need to do is buy and use a stack of travel information, such as this stack called Business Class. You would tell HyperCard where you are presently located relative to the city or country for which you want information, and tell HyperCard the current conversion rate of exchange from the foreign currency to your currency. Let's say the rate is six francs to the dollar. We'll enter six. We then select the country or capital city for which we want information. You'll see a map of France and several icons, which are really buttons all along the bottom of the card. From these buttons, you can click to access all kinds of information about France. Suppose you have 5,000 francs. We use the currency converter to see how many U.S. dollars those 5,000 francs are worth, and vice versa. And once you've finished, you just click on the home button. Well, Mary, 
that gives you a good description of browsing and retrieving with HyperCard. Our next story is about using HyperCard to add or change information in a stack. Now, earlier today, we found out who might use this and why. HyperCard has five levels for using it, um, and they range uh, to be a nice, easy transition from one to the next. Uh, the lowest one is browsing, in which you just click on things and look around. The next level up is typing. You can make new cards and type information into them. That's the level you would use if you just want to use your address book to keep names and addresses in it. Um, you can make new cards, you can type into them, you can browse around, but you can't uh, draw pictures, which is the next level, uh, painting. Uh, in painting, you can get the tool palette, which um, has on it uh, a lot of tools for painting that you recognize if you've ever used Mac Paint. Actually, these are better. Um, you can uh, draw on the card and um, you know, make all kinds of pictures. You can change the fonts or sizes of fields that it displays information in. You can copy a button that dials a phone from one stack where you're already using it. You can paste it into another stack you're using and make that stack dial the phone. So you can customize it to make the application work the way you want the application to. And that's making the computer work the way you want it to, not the way the person who programmed it wanted to. Let's see how this works by going back to our roving reporter, uh, who doesn't quite seem to be roving anymore, but still at the Macintosh keyboard. Hello, Mary. You know, this is really something. <laughs> and Gary, we've just learned about adding and changing existing cards, so why don't you show us how it really works? I'd be glad to show you. HyperCard provides you with the ultimate organizer. Let's see. Suppose you are a busy executive and have piles of information around you, but no way to easily or quickly get from one piece of information to another. That is, without spending a lot of time searching for this or that book. You need one way to organize everything. And that's what this is. HyperCard comes with lots of useful stacks to help you out. All the tools you need for a personal organizer are included, such as an address book. This is a stack where you can keep all your important names and addresses. There's also a date book, which includes a monthly calendar, a week-at-a-glance memo book, and things-to-do list. You can use this to organize your daily tasks and to keep track of meetings and social events. Then there's a file index, which is a set of file cards set aside for whatever you need to file. And last, but certainly not least, there's a phone card that actually dials your telephone. It includes a button to access area codes. To open up the address book, I just click on the address stack. Here, I can sort by first name, last name, or date. I can click on the browse button and flip through the cards as they appear in the stack. I can then add a new name, address, and phone information to an existing stack and I can even automatically dial that number. If at any time I want to go back and review a card I've already seen, all I need to do is click on Recent from the Go menu, and I'll see the last 42 cards. They will all appear on the screen at once, and I just need to then click on the individual card I want, and it will automatically appear on the screen. Let's close with a final comment from Bill Atkinson. There was a message of love and excitement that was poured into Macintosh, and people got it. They, they feel that when they use it. When they use a Macintosh, they feel it, okay? Whatever, whatever mood or ex, uh, feeling an artist has as they're making their art get, comes through in the product. And even though you don't meet directly the people who painted that painting, you know something about them from the feel of the painting. That happens with a program, too. I hope that HyperCard um, will show some of the openness that I'm feeling. Tonight.